This time, the demon didn't make it through. Nightingale asked weakly, is the demon dead? Maisie brought the high-ranking demon over, finding no signs of life. Agatha breathed a sigh of relief, expressing that their survival was a complete miracle. Nightingale looking at her injured sisters, wondered how she would explain this to Roland when they returned. Agatha shook her head, stating that this was no ordinary victory. Their enemy was a magic slayer. Back in the Federation era, there was no way for a group of high awakened witches to fight a magic slayer. Only the transcendent witches could defeat a magic slayer. This was a lesson learned in blood by the Federation. Leaf questioned, what is the ability of a magic slayer? Agatha clarified that it wasn't an ability, but a title. These high-ranking demons possessed numerous abilities, not awakened like a witch, but somehow developed within them. It was once observed that a high-ranking demon, having led numerous attacks on Takira over several years, developed two additional magical energies within itself, signaling the acquisition of at least two new abilities. No one knew how the demons managed to do this, but their utilization of magical power seemed innately superior to that of the witches. Nightingale recalled how the demon had pulled her out of the mist world earlier. Agatha said these demons have the ability to interrupt magical energy and even have a chance to breach the defense of the Stone of God punishment. Moreover, magic slayers can dispel magical effects and halt witches' abilities from taking effect. They are formidable adversaries to any witch. If he was still confused, why did Agatha say it's not an ability? Agatha took Anna for example, if Anna became a magic slayer, her fire ability would not be interrupted by the Stone of God punishment, at the same time, within the range of Anna's ability, all other magical abilities would be cancelled. Except the enemy was another magic slayer. Nightingale relayed what had happened, pondering if that was why the Divine Seal imprint failed to kill this high-ranking demon the first time. Agatha didn't have an answer, since this was her first encounter with a magic slayer. And previously, the Federation hadn't used Divine Seal imprints against magic slayers. The victories of the Federation's top three seats were achieved through their own power. That was where the true strength of transcendent witches lay. While wearing the Stone of God's punishment, they shone like the sun on the battlefield, melting away demons like butter. The strongest among them was Acherus. Unfortunately, there was only one Acherus. Nightingale thought for a moment, and even counting all three of the top seats in the Federation, there were only three transcendent witches. She wondered has there ever been a witch who became a magic slayer within the Federation? Agatha shook her head. Perhaps witches can never become magic slayers, because there's an intrinsic difference between witches and demons. Maisie, who had been fiddling with the armor, suddenly flipped a box out of the dark remains. Opening it, several crystal-clear stones tumbled out. Pushing her white hair from her forehead, Maisie curiously checked the stone. Agatha, looking at the stones on the ground, recognized them as magic stones, and judging by their color, they seemed to be of high quality. Leaf chimed in saying she didn't expect high-ranking demons to hide these inside their bodies. Excited, Maisie wondered whether the other demons might have similar boxes within them. She transformed and swiftly flew towards the other demon corpses. Agatha cautioned, be careful not to touch the jars containing the red mist. Soon, Wendy arrived, bringing soldiers from the first army. She looked worriedly at Anna, who lay on Leaf. Leaf assured that Anna was just unconscious due to her magic being depleted. Lightning soon came over too, having been struck down by a demon while flying, and passed out. Nightingale went over and patted the little girl's head, thankful that lightning was okay. Brian, looking at the demon's body, was shocked, so this was their enemy, a demon? Nightingale instructed Brian to have the soldiers transport everything back. The flesh, armor, clothing, and weapons, not leaving a single item behind, as per his majesty's command. Hearing the order, Brian immediately became serious and assured it would be arranged. Agatha sighed regretfully for not having captured a living demon. Lightning tilted her head, seems like there was one, but she was not sure. All eyes turned to her. Lightning continued, if demons can swim, maybe it's still alive. 
In the afternoon, the ship left the river bank, turning back towards the city of Neverwinter. Within the cabin of one of the ships was surrounded by curious and puzzled First Army soldiers. Looking at the demon's body, it seemed no different from them, just taller. Someone muttered, didn't he see the witch ladies getting seriously injured? Another soldier added that the other demon who died must have been incredibly ferocious, much more difficult to handle than the demonic beasts, even Lady Anna almost fell victim. Thinking of Lady Anna's strength, the soldiers fell silent. That's why the witch's ladies were so cautious, chopping off the limbs of the demons. Nightingale returned to the deck, relieved that, despite the huge unexpected incident, they had successfully completed the mission. Agatha looked at her, asking if she needed to rest. Touching the wound on her waist, Nightingale nonchalantly waved her hand, saying she had been treated by Leaf. Before meeting His Majesty Roland, Leaf was responsible for all the injuries of the association. Agatha exhaled, glad that everyone was safe. She regretted her oversight during this entire operation. Nightingale comforted her, it wasn't her fault, no one expected a high-ranking demon to appear. Agatha looked towards the sea. She was also confused. These high-ranking demons always hid behind large armies, never acted alone, and were very scarce. She originally thought they would only encounter them after the red moon descended, but seeing those magic stones, she was no longer sure because there were too many magic stones on them. Nightingale quickly understood the implication in her words, but as soon as she did, a chill rose from the depths of her heart. The lifespan of demons, their growth limits, how they evolved and methods of reproduction were all unknown. What had they developed into during these 400 years? If the enemy could accumulate so many magic stones, could they also accumulate a multitude of high-ranking demons? Gazing at the moonlight, the two of them hoped that when they found the answers, it wouldn't be too late. Edith and her brother finally arrived in the Western Territory, and this time there was someone following them. He invited Edith to find a clean hotel and then took them to stroll around the market, meticulously explaining that he could also serve Edith. Edith put on a grateful expression, slightly curtsying as she thanked the man for his help along the way. She said she would go to the town hall to seek help next where she should be able to find news of her relatives. The man bid farewell to Edith in a gentlemanly manner, continuously waving at her as he left, saying he looked forward to their next meeting. Cole laughed, saying his sister was really popular. Edith glanced at him, asking what he should call her. Cole coughed twice and said, Miss Edith. Looking at the border town, in a short period of time, the Western Territory was integrated into a new city, with a population and commercial trade both exceeding the previous royal capital. Such an extraordinary lord, however, had a bad title under his name. This piqued Edith's interest in Roland. A personal guard entered the office and reported that an envoy from the north was waiting outside the castle, hoping to be seen by Roland. The visitor was the second son of the current Duke of the Northern Territory, Calvin Cond. The guard reported that Minister Barov had already checked the credentials and family crest. Roland became interested and followed the guard to the meeting room. Along the way, the guard said that the envoy, Sir Cole, claimed that Duke Cond was willing to pledge allegiance to Roland. However, Roland felt this was somewhat troublesome. Entering the meeting room, there were only two people from the envoy group sitting at one end of the long table. One of them must be Duke's second son, Cole Cond. The other made Roland's eyes light up slightly, she was a woman of good looks and appearance. It seemed that she should be Cole's deputy, but for some reason, her aura was even more eye-catching than Sir Cole himself. Cole rose respectfully and quickly stated his purpose, mentioning that he also had a gift for Roland. Cole explained that the Hose and Lister families of the Northern Territory, two count families, refused to obey King Roland's rule and even tried to conspire with other nobles to rebel. His father saw through their schemes early and meted out deserved punishments to both families. With a touch of regret, Cole said, but due to his negligence, he did not expect King Roland to return to the Western Territory early, and the two heads that were supposed to serve as evidence have decayed on the way. Roland looked at Cole asking if his father executed the two counts directly. Cole glanced at the girl beside her and then nodded in affirmation. 
The level of allegiance was more intense than Roland had anticipated, offering the heads of two counts as a letter of credence meant that they would find it hard to gain support from other territories' nobles again, at least significantly reducing the possibility of them uniting to resist Roland's own territory. Roland thought to himself, but with Nightingale not around at the moment, he didn't know whether the other party was trying to deceive him. He pondered for a moment, then whispered to Barov at his side, Are these two families in the Northern Territory? Barov slowly explained in Roland's ear that these two families were even more prominent than the five major families in the Western Territory. However, the Khan family of the Duke emerged prominently only 50 years ago. Barov said he hadn't expected Timothy to pick their family as the ruler of the Northern Territory. Even if it was to contain the other two families, if there was a significant disparity in strength, it would be difficult to play its due role and could easily cause dissatisfaction among the established families. It seems that what Cole said it should be true, Barov whispered, this is related to the honor of the nobility. If Roland agrees to accept their allegiance and it gets out and is proven to be a lie, the Northern Territory will fall into chaos first. Roland smiled at Cole and expressed his gratitude to the Duke. Upholding the royal honor is the duty of every noble, and Cole's father did it well. Moreover, the two counts got what they deserved, and the kingdom would not hold Duke Cond accountable for this. Cole seemed to breathe a sigh of relief and thanked His Majesty Roland, saying his father would be very pleased to hear this. His father had always hoped to serve a true king, and now he finally had the chance. Roland nodded, saying he was also happy to accept the Duke's allegiance, provided he could comply with Greycastle's new laws. Cole was slightly taken aback, having not heard of the new laws. Roland explained that he would be taking away some of the nobles' power. In the future, there will be no more feudal nobles in the kingdom. Simply put, within Greycastle, all territories will have only one true ruler and that is the king. Cole's expression changed drastically, turning once again to look at his assistant. Roland looked at the young man in front of him, telling him not to worry. The nobles were still nobles, their luxurious lives would not change, and they even had the opportunity to reach new heights. He had Barov give Cole a brochure, which contained all of the new laws and told him that the change Goose stronghold had fully implemented this set of laws. Cole opened the brochure and read a few pages, his face blank and slightly tense. Cole's performance left Roland slightly disappointed, but on second thought, it was normal. After all, he was a kid. Presumably, his role in this trip was only to convey a message and he could not make decisions. He told Cole to first convey the message to Duke Cond, and before getting a reply, he could stay in the city of Neverwinter and seek around for himself. Cole anxiously looked at the woman next to him. The woman did not speak. She then patted him on the back. Just Roland thought that the talk would end here, but unexpectedly, Cole made another request. Cole asked if he could participate in seeing how Roland's territory manufactures steamboats and steam engines. This was indeed an intriguing request, and Roland looked at him with interest, wondering if he was interested in this? Cole said he was very fascinated by this kind of peculiar vessel. Roland nodded, instructing Bereff to make arrangements. After dealing with the envoy, Roland returned to his office. Lightning was sprawled on the window with Maisie pecking at the glass above her head. A tightness instantly gripped Roland's heart, it was only the third day, and the crew should not have returned so quickly, had something happened? He opened the large windows, hurriedly asking, what happened? The two pounced on Roland, exclaiming they had caught a demon. When he heard from Maisie that Anna and Nightingale were injured, and then Lightning added that it was not a big deal, Roland felt his heart go on a roller coaster ride. He exhaled, then questioned if they were really both right? Both nodded in unison. He turned and ran out of the room to call someone to bring Nanawa over, and told the two to finish what they were saying in one breath next time. In the evening, two steamboats finally appeared at the dock of the Crimson Water River. Seeing Anna and Nightingale walk down, Roland completely relaxed. He smiled opening his arms to Anna. Anna quickly plunged into his arms, hugging him tightly. Nightingale sighed, saying Roland should have waited for them in the castle, as the dock was not safe. 
Anna released Roland and also pulled Nightingale over. Roland opened his arms and hugged Nightingale as well. Then it was Wendy, Leaf, and all the witches hugged Roland one after another, Agatha and Iffy were no exception. Two canisters of red mist had already been used on the road, one was damaged in battle, and the remaining supply could only last until the following evening. If Agatha was to attempt to create a magical seal experiment, it must begin before noon the next day. Roland inquired about the lethal effects of the red mist on witches, asking how Agatha would change the canisters. Pointing to the container on one side, she explained that she would have ordinary people assist with connecting the tubes, and she also brought back those smaller storage canisters, which might be useful in the future. Roland nodded. Next, he turned to Breeze and asked if she could control the demon to use magic power. Breeze responded, it should be possible. Roland then asked Nanoa to assist in attaching the limbs back to the demon. Axe brought over the limbs, and with Nanoa's magic, the demon was assembled. After a few minutes, without making a sound, the demon crawled up from the ground and slowly left the shed. Breeze utilized her power, and under her control, the creature stood upright, all while remaining under her control as it exited the ship cabin. Leaf reported that the test field was ready. The demon grabbed a long stick, this was the weapon the demon had carried out. Its arm swelled and the magic stone embedded in its arm emitted a faint yellow light. It forcefully threw it at the target, a white shadow flashed by, and a crisp humming sound emanated from the armor in the distance. The spear completely penetrated the chest plate and was firmly stuck in the wall. Upon removal, it was evident that the spearhead had shattered upon impact. If replaced with an iron short spear, the power might be slightly greater. However, considering the demon's attire, it seems that the enemy's use of iron weapons is even more mediocre than humans, even the armor of high-ranking demons doesn't seem to be purely metallic. The next test was rapid throwing. The demon, controlled by Breeze, was forced to throw two spears as fast as he could, emitting painful roars. It seems that even if its body was controlled, it couldn't avoid the agony brought about by the overuse of the magic stone. After the throw, its arms sagged down. This time, both spears shattered upon hitting the 3mm steel plate. It's observable that the most threatening attack of the demon is comparable to a revolver rifle. While a bolt action rifle could easily penetrate the steel plate at this distance. After reaching this conclusion, Roland breathed a sigh of relief. With these melee demons as the basic combat power, they did not surpass the operational effectiveness of conventional firearms. At a distance of 500 to 1000 meters, machine guns and artillery could pulverize all standing enemies, meaning that at least on the frontal battlefield where the two armies met, humans certainly had the power to fight. How wonderful it would be if Roland were born into Kira, Agatha sighed, looking at the weapon in Roland's hands, back then, they have a hundred times more people than Grey Castle, and so is the case with witches. If everyone had a firearm, perhaps the demons would have been driven back where they came from a long time ago. Roland smiled, but he did not think so. After all, over 400 years ago, it was a kingdom run by witches. If there truly were a weapon that could give commoners power beyond that of witches, would the Federation willingly accept its existence? In any era, witches were a minority. Whether that's now, or 400 years ago. While there were millions of commoners, there were only a few thousand witches. And those commoners who had been oppressed for a long time, would they willingly step onto the battlefield? Of course, he wouldn't say these thoughts aloud. Agatha was just a researcher, and it's better not to involve her in political affairs. Next, they tested the demon's resistance to gunfire on various parts of its body, as well as the effects of various chemicals, church pills, and dream water. Lucia was also asked to try and separate the components of the red mist to see what could be obtained. Unfortunately, they could not keep demons for a long time, and Agatha needed to prepare to make the magical seals. Agatha thought something and then shook her head. Seeing that Agatha did not want to continue speaking, Roland did not ask further. Edith stood by the window, gazing at the city in the night. Merchants often say that candlelight signifies wealth, and in this border town, the market is packed with people even during the night. 
She thought she would only see brightly lit scenes in the pubs or theaters in the inner city area of the royal capital, but here, everything began to surprise her. Suddenly, the sound of knocking outside the bedroom interrupted Edith's thoughts. Cole poked his head in, mentioning that the water was still hot, and asked if his sister wanted to continue her bath. Edith shook her head, telling him to have the servants heat a new basin, then asked Cole if he had figured out how the water system worked here. Cole scratched his head, explaining that the water was released from the tubes, it seemed to flow from those tall iron towers, but as for how the water got pumped up from the wells, he couldn't get a clear answer from the locals. He urged Edith to try the soap, praising how excellent it was for cleaning the body. Edith couldn't help but silently wonder. Was this also a deliberate arrangement by His Majesty? The Envoy Group's residence, located near the castle area, was a four-story building, its top floor even higher than the castle. It not only offered a view of the city of Neverwinter Nightscape but also boasted cleverly arranged and equipped rooms. Although not large, they were extremely comfortable to live in. The official from the city hall who received them mentioned that this place was specially prepared by His Majesty for foreign envoys and seemed to be called the Diplomatic Building. In Edith's eyes, whether it was the clear water that gushed out endlessly when the valve was turned or the soap that Cole praised incessantly, they were likely deliberate displays arranged by Roland Wimbledon. During the afternoon, the two also visited the steam engines. Cole didn't understand what was so beautiful about these black blocks, but King Roland seemed to think they were. Edith closely inspected the steam engine, agreeing with Roland's assertion that this was truly beauty. The beauty brought about by the power of technology, a form of beauty incomparable to jewels and garments. How did Roland come to acquire such knowledge? Edith wondered as she gazed out of the window. What else did he know beyond this? Edith, sitting in a chair, asked her brother what he thought of the new laws. Cole, hesitating, responded that he would write a letter to inform their father of the conditions laid out by His Majesty tomorrow, but he didn't think their father would agree. Edith said nothing. Seeing that his sister did not deny it, Cole gained a little more courage. He had read the new laws, and agreeing to them meant handing over their territory and giving up on their power. This was not a promotion, but a clear demotion. Edith nodded with a smile, agreeing that Cole made a good point, but he overlooked one thing. Cole looked at his sister, puzzled. Edith slowly stood up. Could they really hold on to these positions and power? She asked Cole why they granted lands to their knights and vassals. Cole responded that doing so ensured their loyalty and attracted more people to join them. Edith nodded, then asked, what if their father kept all the land to himself? Cole thought for a moment, if that happened, everyone would leave the Northern Territory. Those without land would go elsewhere, other nobles would also gradually leave, and in the end, only their family would remain. Edith looked at her brother, wouldn't that be good? Cole blinked, seemingly perplexed as to why his sister would ask such an apparent question. The North was so vast, how could they possibly manage it all? Even collecting taxes and grains on a usual basis was quite troublesome. Edith did not respond directly but said that this was also what His Majesty considered to be the main cause of the feudal system, it ultimately arose from the need for war and limitations in management capabilities. Edith sighed. However, the situation has changed now. No matter how they expanded their forces, they could not withstand a strike from His Majesty, whose army was unmatched in the entire kingdom. At the same time, His Majesty firmly believed that the city hall could manage the affairs of the whole territory, and thus there was no need to grant lands to the nobles anymore. Cole opened his mouth but was unsure how to respond. Edith spoke slowly, Roland Wimbledon believes that such a regime, with unified management and planning, could better utilize the resources of the entire territory, tap into the potential of the people, take power away from the noble, and grant the citizens the power to vote and choose, and thus unleash powerful productivity throughout the kingdom. Cole stepped back a couple of steps thinking this was all nonsense. What was productivity? A competition of who could farm better. Where would Roland find enough people? Without nobles, who would collect the grain and taxes? Most commoners didn't care who was king. 
Edith was also very curious about this point, so they decided to visit again tomorrow, and this time, she would speak. The next day, the test reports were sent to Roland's desk. The demons' bodies were not invincible, both firearms and blades could cause their fatal injuries, but perhaps due to different physiological structures, the damage effects of toxins and chemicals were minimal. For example, chlorine, nitrous oxide, and carbon monoxide did not affect the demons, and neither did dream water or the church's pills, dream water did not make them sleep, and the church's pill could not cause them to react violently. As for the red mist, once decomposed, it turned into several gases in water. After testing by Kyle, it was confirmed that a part of it could burn and emit a foul odor, while another part was nitrogen, with the remaining components unidentified. Moreover, when the temperature rose to 300 degrees, the red mist would decompose more quickly, and approaching 800 degrees, the mist would even ignite. Roland filed the report away in a drawer. For now, it seemed that besides conventional firearm weapons, fire was also a good choice to deal with the demons, at least in dispersing the red mist. The effect of high temperature was very significant. When attacking the enemy camp, a large fire might be able to instantly reverse the situation of the demons fighting on home ground. The guard knocked and entered, stating that an envoy from the Northern Territory sought to visit Roland. Roland was slightly surprised, it had only been one day. After a moment of silence, he ordered, take them to the meeting room and inform Carter to lock down the diplomatic building, temporarily preventing the rest of the Northern envoys from going out. Roland thought to himself, since the other party couldn't recognize the policies he was going to implement, he might as well forcibly keep them here. When Roland entered the meeting room, this time it wasn't Cole standing in the front, but rather the girl sitting beside him yesterday. The girl stood up and performed a standard noble courtesy, introducing herself as Edith Kahn, the eldest daughter of the Duke of Northern Territory, and also Cole's sister. She apologized for Cole for getting to introduce her identity last time and hoped Roland would forgive it. Roland became interested, it turned out this girl was the real leader of this envoy group. Edith looked at Roland and said that this time her father had entrusted her with full responsibility, and the Duke's seal had also been handed over to her. Roland nodded, he knew that in this era, it was quite rare for a woman to participate in politics, let alone a young, beautiful girl. After both parties sat down, Roland asked what the purpose of visiting him was this time. Edith picked up the brochure that Roland had given her, stating she had several questions. Roland thought she would tactfully express her inability to accept these conditions, but he didn't expect her to come over and discuss politics with him. Looking at her sincere eyes, Roland realized she was serious. Edith's first question was, without the assistance of the nobles, how could Roland effectively manage the vast territories of the kingdom? Roland answered, the people, and the advancement of technology. He then explained slowly, allowing common folks to get an education, and through the training from the city hall, allow the common folks to help govern the kingdom. Edith then asked several more questions, such as how to prevent administrative officials from neglecting their duties, how trade would be distributed throughout the kingdom after unification, and whether productivity could truly serve as a standard for measuring policies. Roland answered each one, without any pause, and the more she asked, the brighter Edith's eyes shone. It wasn't until close to noon that she exhaled deeply, realizing that Roland indeed knew what he was doing. Both of them took a sip of tea. Edith asked if Roland could provide the Northern Territories with steam engines, as well as the production equipment and personnel for the steamships? Roland replied he couldn't provide the personnel at the moment, but he could allow people from the Northern Territory to come and learn. The prerequisite is that the Northern nobles comply with his administration. As for the steamship, that's possible too. As long as Edith pays enough gold, none of these are issues. Edith was somewhat surprised by Roland's forthrightness. After a moment of contemplation, she further inquired, according to Roland's plan, if Roland waited just ten more years, he could easily take over the entire Grey Castle. By then, promoting the new policy would face no resistance, and Roland wouldn't need to concern himself with anyone's opinions. Why is Roland so eager now? Roland fell silent for a while before finally saying, if Edith really wants to know the answer, follow him to see something.